mountain sheep, nomadic people, horses, and more sheep. A former Soviet state just 30 years into its independence. A land covered almost entirely in mountains. A place of culture and traditions as tough as the land. Did I mention sheep? Because there are more sheep than people here. And while I'm here for the sheep, I think I'll stick around Kyrgyzstan for the people, even if those people are about to work me to death. Something tells me this ride's gonna be brutal. I think so. <laughs> I think so. Great. <laughs> right from the horse's mouth. No matter who you are. Oh, shit. No matter what you want your life to be, you're gonna be a star. Tomorrow's another day. Now for a beer. Rolling like a VIP. I'm a little scared. Yeah. I'm a bunch of smelly, growing men. I don't even know where to start. I think we're in trouble. That might be the best birthday present ever. Baby wipes, gold bar. If you can't figure out why, just think about it for a little bit. I have been on a lot of adventures in my life that have led me to some pretty incredible places. But if I'm honest, very few have captured my imagination and my overall desire to visit a place more than the country of Kyrgyzstan, especially its capital city of Bishkek. The mixture of Cold War Soviet buildings and colorful Kyrgyz decor and the vibrance of the people here combine to give it a feeling that is as unique as its name. I'm here because Kyrgyzstan is home to a subspecies of the Marco Polo sheep. The Marco Polo and its subspecies live in five countries, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and China, but they can only be hunted in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. The flight here from the US can take anywhere between 16 and 21 hours, and then once you're here it takes another 10 to 15 hours of driving just to get to your hunting location. Now I've made it all the way to Bishkek, and it's here that I meet up with my guide, Saku. Tomorrow we'll begin the trek to the mountains. But first, Saku gives me a little tour of his hometown and a deeper look into what life is like in Kyrgyzstan. It doesn't take very long looking around here to see the interesting melding between the old Soviet buildings with the new colorful Kyrgyz banners and stuff like that. This is an interesting combination of those two times and those two cultures, isn't it? In a few days, we are going to have 30 years anniversary of independence of our oh, country, wow. okay. Kyrgyz Republic. And Which is the fall from the Soviet Union, yeah, right? Yeah, from the fall of the Soviet Union. Under Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union, the Kyrgyz people were treated brutally, to say the least. Many of the nomadic people of the country were forced to give their animals to the Soviets and centralize into the cities for work, and some have claimed that nearly half of the Kyrgyz in the north died under Stalinist repression. But after Stalin died, this repression slowly lifted, and decades later, under Gorbachev's reforms, the Kyrgyz started to regain influence over their own homeland, and a sense of national pride set in. But after time, Periods of poor governance fan the flames of not only civil war, but also ethnic intolerance. Saku tells me that 30 years ago when the Iron Curtain fell, the Kyrgyz people not only gained their independence, but people like Saku started to realize that not everything they learned under the Soviet regime was 100% true. Before I met Americans first time, it was 1993, I had a different opinion about them because brainwashed by Soviet propaganda, same way, likewise, right. you did about us, right? Yeah. So for me, Americans seem it as kind of terrible people, more dangerous <laughs> <laughs> capitalists. Right. It took many years to get used to the Americans. And now it's 2021. Yeah, yeah. You're allowed to talk to Americans yeah, yeah. and you think we're cool. And have beer together. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. I like that idea. A few beers that evening in Bishkek definitely helped bury the American Soviet Cold War hatchet. And the next morning we began our 15 hour trek to the mountains. We'll be hunting at an altitude of around 13,000 feet. And altitude sickness is a real thing. And one of the major causes of it is going too high too fast. So after five hours of our drive, we stop here for the night. Things are finally starting to feel real. I mean, we've been kind of on ice for the last couple of days. First day in Bishkek, then we drove like five, six hours here to this little resort to kind of acclimatize to the, to the altitude and stuff. Now we're loading up 10 plus hours of a driving ahead of us in the mountains, which I'm not looking forward to that part, but I am looking forward to being in camp because tomorrow we start hunting. I think one of my favorite things 
about trips like this is watching a place unfold as you leave the city. And I didn't get a chance to watch things unfold for too darn long before the guys wanted to make a very important and homegrown pit stop. So we've been driving here in every little town that we go through, there's somebody on the side of the road with apricots for sale, which is really, really a common fruit here. And these guys all of a sudden, they're like, stop, stop, stop. Apparently this one looks like a good one. We'll go put you in for seven. I promise. Oh my God. That is so good. If you know me, then you know I love to eat. And I'll try anything at least once. Beef intestine. I'm gonna be honest, I don't like that at all. And after a few more hours of driving, we stopped for lunch in a little village called Caracol, which Saku has told me is also home to a very unique ethnic dish. 145 years ago, the group of ethnic group of called Dungans fled from China and settled in Central Asia, mainly in the territory of the Kyrgyzstan. They brought with them their own cuisine yeah. to our culture. The food is called Ashram food. The Dungan people are an ethnic minority of Muslims that still live here. They fled China to eastern Kyrgyzstan to escape religious persecution in the 1870s. The pre-Soviet Russians who ruled Kyrgyzstan at that time accepted them because of the crops they grew, their exceptional work ethic, and the foods they brought with them, such as the dish we're having now, Ashlin Fu, which Saku tells me is also an excellent cure for an ancient problem, the hangover. You know, people, the alcoholics, yeah who won't try to be sober again, yeah. they eat that after the party night. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Perfect, maybe I need to make some Ashland food at home. I'm in Kyrgyzstan in the small town of Karakol, where I just ate a dish called Ashland Foo for the first time. And it was not only delicious, but also pretty fascinating. I think the most interesting thing about this that you forget when you talk to your friends back home and you tell them you're going to, you know, Kyrgyzstan, they're like, oh, you know, they think Afghanistan or, or Middle East, right? You forget that just because it has Stan at the end of it doesn't mean that it's, it's like that at all. We're right on the border of China. This is a good reminder of that. Yep. It is good. Video, video. We get back on the road for our long drive to camp, and even though we got more and more remote, I found that one thing is universal, all roads need rest stops, even if these aren't quite like the ones at home. You gotta go, you gotta go. Even though it's a hole in the ground. Now it's no secret that I love mountains. They're big, they're beautiful, and of course they're home to the sheep that I'm here for. However, Kyrgyzstan is smaller than my home state of Minnesota, and yet we're driving over 15 hours just to get halfway across the country to camp. Why? Because roughly 80% of Kyrgyzstan is covered in mountains, big mountains, and the roads that go to the most remote parts are often just Soviet Cold War era military roads that are in most cases unmaintained. But if you ask me, that's a small sacrifice to make for the fact that I'm on my way to my dream hunt. So today is a day of acclimatization. You know, we're at 12,000 feet. I can feel it, definitely I get a little bit of a headache. So today's a day of chilling out, sighting in the rifles. Where'd that one go? Right in there, bullseye. I've had animals run and I've had women run, but I've never had targets run. So let's just hope that that's not a sign of things to come. When it comes to hunting off the grid, I'm definitely happy with just a tent to sleep in, which I'll be doing soon enough. But when we arrived at this outfitter's base camp, I was blown away. How the heck they built this place in the middle of nowhere blows my mind. But I'll admit that after the drive we just had, it offered a very welcome good night's rest and good meal that we were definitely gonna need because the next morning, it was time to get going. So it's finally happening. Saku and I are finally headed up the mountain after meeting years and years ago at SCI. Things keep getting delayed, now here we are. But I have a feeling I don't quite know what I'm about to be in store for. Something tells me this ride's gonna be brutal. I think so. <laughs> I think so, great. <laughs> right from the horse's mouth. 
After all this time, the moment had come, and one by one, I met the rest of the team that would head up the mountain with us. I couldn't speak to any of them. Big man on a little horse. <laughs> but every one of them knew how to say one thing in English, and that was, it's time to ride. The Kyrgyz people have roamed these mountain steps on horses for millennia. For the ancient Kyrgyz, their greatest asset was arguably the horse. And even nowadays, horses have great meaning to them. Wars were fought on horseback. Games are played on horseback. There's even a wedding tradition that's still practiced that involves riding horses. And they don't just provide transportation, they provide meat and milk and a delicacy that comes from that milk called kumis. The Kyrgyz horseback tradition runs so deep that even the people who live in towns and cities here often still have a horse to ride. Manhood here is often judged by horsemanship. Now I grew up around horses myself, so hopefully that gives me a leg up in the manhood department around here, and these guys don't just see me as another fat American on a little Kyrgyz horse. Well, this moment happened faster than I thought it would. We've been riding four, five hours, came up over a ridge, and there are Marco Polo sheep there, 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 like all a thousand yards away. I've been waiting my whole life for this moment. Now the problem is that they're everywhere. Good thing and a bad thing. What do we do now? Now this is the kind of problem I like to have, especially on the first day. Of course, every instinct in my body is telling me to go after the biggest ram as soon as we can. But Saku and the other guides, well, they had a different plan. Eat and rest, sit and talk and wait. So what did I do? Well, I took a nap. Here I was, literally living out one of my wildest dreams, hunting Marco Polo sheep in the high mountains of Kyrgyzstan. We had over 50 sheep within a mile of where we sit, and after a few hours of glassing and identifying two big rams in one of the groups, we make our first chess move in their direction. We're at around 13,000 feet above sea level. And up here, your blood is thin, the oxygen levels are low, and the weather can be completely unpredictable. And as if that wasn't enough, the open terrain can often make stalking basically impossible, even with a high-powered rifle. I had everything I needed to make this hunt a success, but today the one thing I didn't have enough of was time. Day one has been pretty epic, to say the least. I went on one of the best horseback rides through one of the most beautiful spots I've ever seen in my life. I saw my first sheep, Marco Polo sheep, and now we're 700 yards from at least one shooter ram. So we're just gonna leave them for tonight. Make camp, come back here in the morning. They should be here. I like that plan, mainly because I don't want this to be over yet. Pretty amazing. <laughs> Breakfast of champions. In the morning, while I fed my face, there was something special happening around me that I didn't notice at first. But then, on that mountain when I had my first cup of Kyrgyz tea, it hit me. So it's my first morning, and I'd be lying if I said that yesterday it didn't absolutely kick my ass. It did. This altitude sickness thing is for real. I woke up, I'm tired, I have a headache, but then you get up and you see this glacier that I just slept underneath, and I watch these guys doing, you know, Kyrgyz cultural stuff, tea and bread and communally hanging out. These guys don't even know each other, some of them. And then I see these horses here. Then I get my own glass of tea. The altitude sickness goes away right away. This is a good day. It's gonna be a good day. Hi. 
high mountains and high winds. Often those things go hand in hand and here in Kyrgyzstan, that is definitely what we're dealing with. By now, I've realized that without horses, this hunt would be nearly impossible. They allow us to cover so much ground. And that morning, we headed back to where we had left the rams the night before. But on our way, we accidentally bumped a completely different group of big rams. And Saku told me that this will be one of the biggest challenges we face for this entire hunt. The biggest problem is going to be not the animals we can't find, but the, the, the ones the, you can get close to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, that's the more difficult part how we can get close to because we have to go through the open many areas. different groups yeah. you know because of the open area yeah so that's that's the challenge for us well it's a good problem to have lots of ramps i like many. i like that too many ramps i'm for it we moved from one ridge to another to another and once again we came upon another group of rams and there was one ram in there that I gladly would have taken and I set up for a shot but mother nature had completely different plans. We'd made a plan to head to slightly lower ground out of the wind and then we came across another group of big rams. The problem was they were on the move and that meant so were we. We did everything we could to cut them off but we were just a few minutes too late. If we had been here five minutes earlier, just five minutes, they'd have walked right past where we needed to be. Two minutes, Two minutes. fine, whatever. So close. And there were some big rams in there. Oh. Over the years, I've had all sorts of close calls, and I can't tell you how many times I have said, you know, if you fall off the horse, well, you need to get back on and try again. Well, this time, that is literally what we did. We got back on the horses and we played cat and mouse with those rams for hours. Every time we'd spot them, we were never quite in the right position. That is, until one time, we were. been thinking about these these animals since I was a little kid the two white sheep the doll sheep and the Marco Polo both things that I thought never in a million years that I would be able to do kid from Minnesota from a little town yeah we didn't grow up with a whole bunch of money this is not something I ever thought I'd ever be able to do. That's so scary. Unbelievable. Just like what happened in camp earlier on that second morning, I didn't realize at first what was happening around me. And then it hit me. There on the side of that mountain with the sun going down, I watched a group of guys, some of whom hardly knew each other, revert to some of the most ancient of their traditions. The nomadic Kyrgyz people of these mountains have survived on sheep like this for millennia. And for a moment, I get to share that tradition with them. Well, that's a first. First I like a lot. When we arrived in camp that night, nothing went to waste. They rendered down fresh fat from the sheep and then cooked the best liver and onions I'd ever had. Tradition was everywhere around me, and I was so grateful to get to share this experience with this incredible group of men. We just packed up camp and the guides cooked uh, part of my sheep last night with a broth all night long stewed it all night so we just ate that like fresh basically sheep broth with meat we're waiting to have a little tea heating up some water and as you can see now it's snowing like crazy so 
It's going to be an interesting day to say the least. Now it's time to go after the Ibex.